prošla i na kraju seminara dana sa predvodavanjem svako će dobiti, svi poslici će dobiti sertifikate koji su napravljeni ovde i potpisani od strane Andrewa i još nekih u opru Suzi i isto arhitektorskog kudeta, stvari ja sam potpisala i profesor Obradović. I mislim da kada se završi da ćemo imati jednu, ne znam da ćemo da se slikamo, da će biti opći biti grupna fotografija. Znači nemojte da izlađete, ostavite da to kraje obavezno i znači slikat ćemo se svi, to će biti grupna fotografija i dobit ćete sertifikate. Inače, mislim da možemo krenuti sa predavanjem, čekali smo malo da se skupaj ljudi. Andrew, please. Well, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to our third lecture. So these are the topics I'm going to discuss today. Uh, first of all, um, just to uh, explain the design philosophy against earthquake. Then I want to just share with you a few uh, new technologies or new approaches in seismic resistant design. And then for the most of the lecture, I'm going to look at um, some of the architectural issues that have to be um, solved, really, by collaboration between architect and engineer to get safe, um, safe buildings. So, first of all, um, I just want to explain that in terms of the philosophy of seismic design, there are two main objectives. First of all, to prevent our building getting too badly damaged in small earthquakes. Earthquakes that can occur rather frequently, like every 20 or 50 years. And the second objective is to prevent a building from collapsing in a large earthquake that will occur perhaps on average once every 500 years or more. And so first of all, to satisfy the first objective, we make sure our buildings are quite stiff so that in small earthquakes they don't deflect too much and therefore cause too much damage uh, to the architectural elements like the partitions and infills. And so the first objective is, is met by mainly making our buildings stiff enough. The second objective is to prevent our buildings from collapsing. And so most modern codes, uh, including the Euro code, introduces this concept. It might have a different name, but often it's called capacity design. And what that means is that the engineer possibly in discussion with the architect, chooses the parts of the structure that will suffer damage in a large earthquake. And then, the engineer will provide a hierarchy of strength so that only the selected elements will get damaged and the most crucial elements will be undamaged. And this will prevent the building collapsing. And the final phase of this is the engineer has to do some special detailing of what we call the structural fuses so that even though the fuses are damaged they're not going to lose their strength. Now, if we look at a, a concrete shear wall building, in a large earthquake, it can suffer several types of failure mode. 
For example, it could suffer a sheer failure. Or it could suffer severe bursting of the concrete at the base. Or it could suffer foundation failure. Or finally, it could be designed so that it experiences ductile yielding of the primary reinforcement. There will be damage, but it may be repairable. So this is what we call a ductile failure. In an earthquake overload, this is the failure we want. We can't avoid damage, but this, this is the best failure because it's the easiest to repair. And we avoid these failures that are very brittle and could lead to collapse. And we also avoid foundation failure, which is basically impossible to repair. If we look at a frame, a frame building, a moment frame building, when we apply this principle, we are trying to achieve the frame deflecting like this, where at the end of each beam, we get what we call plastic hinges. We get damage. We get the earthquake energy absorbed by damage in steel. And so this is the ideal situation where in a building we might have tens of plastic hinges. Lots of places for the earthquake energy to be absorbed. And what we have to avoid is the plastic hinges forming at the top and bottom of columns in one story. We must avoid this because that means there are only a few plastic hinges now. And this means the columns in that story will get very severely damaged and the building will probably collapse. The most important structural elements in a building are the columns. Because if the columns get damaged, there's a possibility for the whole building to collapse. And so the engineer's first priority is to protect the columns. And in cases like this, this steel building here, the way the engineers have done that is to make the beams weaker than the columns. And see how the beams have got these notches? That is where the, 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 the beams are going to go plastic and absorb the earthquake energy, just in this region here. And the bolts and the columns, they are designed to be stronger and they are not going to get damaged. It doesn't matter if the ends of the beams get damaged. The beams can still support the gravity loads. But what does matter is that we mustn't have um, the columns getting damaged. And so when it comes to a frame building, the philosophy, the design philosophy is that we should have strong columns and weak beams. That is the number one approach for frame buildings. And so where there is going to be a plastic hinge occurring, and for example there will always be a plastic hinge at the base of a column, but we never want one higher up, in the area where there will be damage, we put in a lot of reinforcing ties. These ties here. 
and they are at very close centers and they are rather like steel bandages to confine the concrete and so even though the concrete is cracked and damaged it can't fall out because we've got all these ties and just it's so important that the ties have these careful bends on them like this because the outer concrete will probably fall away and so we want the, the ties to be anchored into the core of the concrete uh, so that they can act as the steel bandaging to protect the cracked concrete. When it comes to cross bracing, there are different approaches. But for eccentrically braced frames, these are the areas where the steel is going to get damaged. The steel will yield. It'll go plastic. But it'll be hard after the earthquake. And so in these regions, we need special uh, stiffening details so that this part of the beam can get very severely distorted without losing its strength. And we also need some braces to stop this area from buckling. Another approach is in my own School of Architecture in Wellington. Uh, this building was retrofitted about 10 years ago with these uh, diagonal braces because the existing concrete frame was dangerous. And so these are the new braces and you can see a rather strange detail here. This is deliberately weakening the brace. So this will be the fuse region. This will be the region that will stretch plastically and compress plastically. And all the bolts and the other members and connections, they will be stronger than the fuses, than these regions. And so the bracing will be ductile. It's impossible for it to snap or break. And so we hope that after a really big earthquake, uh, the engineers can unbolt these bolts and put in a new fuse and the building is all ready for the next run. Now, just to introduce a few different new technologies uh, for seismic resistance. The first technology is seismic isolation. And I think you might know about this, but just very briefly, it means um, putting the superstructure of a building on a flexible interface between the superstructure and the foundations. And so we want to have uh, these, these are lead rubber bearings. That is one method. And this is another method called uh, friction, friction pendulum dampers where these um, objects are, are, say, stainless steel, and this is a Teflon coating, and so this is almost frictionless. And so in an earthquake, the, the ground moves, but the movement is taken up in the bearings, and so the superstructure has very little shaking. It is largely isolated. And so this is actually the best possible technology in the 21st century so far to protect our buildings from structural and architectural damage. And 
in countries or in places like California, uh, Japan, New Zealand, and uh, even Chile, for example, almost every hospital these days is seismically isolated. Because it's the only way we can be confident in protecting the structure and the contents of a building. And so if you're ever working with a client who wants the best seismic solution, then I think you have to choose that in the meantime. And so this is a, a cross section through the base of a seismically isolated building. And here's the bearing of one sort or another. This is a lead rubber bearing. Uh, this is the foundation slab. This is the superstructure. And we have this isolation plane. And we need these isolation gaps, seismic gaps, so that when the ground moves, the foundations will not affect the superstructure. We require total structural separation between superstructure and foundations, or the ground, covering the drain. And this is the 45 degree angle to allow the cover plate to break free uh, when there's movement. So it's quite simple detailing, and architects and the engineers need to collaborate to achieve um, a detail that has a nice appearance and is functional. And here's some examples of uh, two buildings designed by Toyo Ito that use seismic isolation. Uh, some of you will know Todd's Obata Sando in Tokyo uh, with a perimeter structure inspired by the trees in the street next to the building. Absolutely a beautiful building, but a very compact structure. And so the seismic isolation helped the architects achieve their dream. And then at the Tama Art Library building, just out of Tokyo, this beautiful um, art library building, uh, also seismically isolated. And it's allowed Toyo Ito to have you know, very slender columns at the base here, very, very slender sort of steel concrete arches. And so this is a, a really fabulous example of architecture um, and it's been able to be achieved partially through seismic isolation in a very seismically active country. I'd love to give a whole lecture on this building. Um, I'll just mention one feature of it. Most of the grid lines of this building are curved. It's the only building in the world I know of with all mostly curved grid lines. A nightmare for the contractor, but inside, absolutely wonderful. The next um, new technology that's probably been around for about 15 years is could be called low damage design. And the idea is to avoid damage in the main structural members. And here's one approach where the column and the beams are joined together with post-tensioned cables. And so the cables go the whole width of the building, and they are in tension. And so in an earthquake, when the columns move over and 
when the cracks occur between the beams and the column, the tension in the cable, it sort of snaps the building back to its original position. I don't know if you, in Serbia, do you have those children's toys made of wood with elastic inside? And you push the toy and it springs back. It's just like that. Very simple approach. But it has to be a bit more complicated than that. Uh, here's the building in Wellington. Uh, here are the cables that pull everything together in tension. Here are the cables here. This goes right through the beam to the other side of the building. Here's a, a column. Uh, here's the junction between the beam and the column. And these are dampers. These are like the fuses. And so when the building sways and the cracks, the cracks open, the steel in here, it will yield and absorb the energy of the earthquake. It will dampen, it will prevent the building resonating. And so after an earthquake, the idea is we can just replace these dampers and, and the building is good to go again. <coughs> and so this is another example of a new technology uh, that we're using um, occasionally uh, in Wellington. And, and there are other technologies as well, like we're using a lot of buckling restrained braces uh, and other special types of structural members. So now I would like to just move on to um, some of the structural problems that that we as engineers and architects encounter. And I want to begin with the most dangerous of these problems and the most common because in every damaging earthquake uh, we can see thousands of buildings collapsing because of this problem. And the reason is because the columns are weaker than the beams. And that is a recipe for earthquake disaster. And in the world, we just see thousands and thousands of buildings where the columns are weaker than the beams. And this, this building is one of tens of thousands of buildings like this, for example, in India. And unfortunately, um, I think I mentioned in an earlier lecture, we have to thank or criticize Le Corbusier for this problem, because he wanted to have the open ground floor plan. And so, as you know, architects want to have slender columns at ground floor. But the beams usually above are stronger than those columns. And so the columns are the weak link. They will fail, for sure. And so here are just two examples of two Indian buildings that have collapsed at ground level. Uh, there would have been hundreds and hundreds of collapses like that after this earthquake. And in every country of the world, we see this damage occurring. The weak, soft story. All the earthquake energy is channeled into one story. This is the, the building in the United States where in the 60s and 70s, in the 70s, we first started to understand this problem. This was a brand new hospital for the, the veterans of the Vietnam War who were injured. 
The hospital was only just complete. They had the San Fernando earthquake. The hospital almost collapsed because of this story that was so weak. Uh, the columns got very badly damaged. There was some damage to columns above as well. But most of the damage occurred at just one story. And here you can look at this corner column. It's just incredibly damaged. And in fact, you can see the shading on this wall here. This was an elevator core. And in a hospital, there are about six elevator cores. And they all had a soft story at ground level. And they all collapsed totally fell over. And so imagine trying to get out of the building after the earthquake. You'd go to the stairs, an elevator, and um, just fresh air. Wouldn't it be terrible? So this was in the 70s. This is when we realized the danger of the soft story. Now, often architects require the appearance of deep, strong beams. Say an architect wants to express horizontality. Then maybe the first choice is for a detail like this. But with the spandrel beam, it makes this beam very, very strong. Stronger than the columns. And that is fatal. So what are the options? Well, one option is to make the spandrel beam of precast concrete. And then we can have some rather loose bolted connections so that the building can move, but just like the scales of a snake allow movement without damaging the scales, so the precast panels will not be damaged when the building moves. Or we could create the depth of the spandrel beams by using lightweight materials. And so we are not making our beams stronger than our columns. Very good strategies. And it means that the architects, you architects, can keep smiling because you've achieved your horizontal design idea. Uh, the next problem of a soft story, I'll just go forward, is when an architect wants a, bit, wants a high and soft ground floor. Like we often see this configuration like for hotels, where the architect requires a, 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 a high ground floor for entry, you know, and atrium space. And so what happens is that the ground floor columns are very long, uh, they are high, and they are more flexible and they are weaker than the structure above. And I mean, this is important architecturally. So how can we achieve that? Or the architect might be interested in floating columns. Oh, sorry. Oh, I've lost my presentation. So maybe the architect wants a, a building elevation like this. Not only are these columns higher and more flexible, but here we've only got three columns. Here we've got five. So this will be a soft story, for sure. So what can we do? Well, there's several, several suggestions. The first suggestion is to to have our floating columns, have a
with our floating columns, like that's a floating column, another floating column. But we make the decision that we're not going to use this frame with floating columns to resist earthquake. It's too dangerous. So therefore, we decide that this frame will just be for gravity loads, just supporting the full stacks and the beams and so on. And then inside the building, inside the plan, we put the earthquake resisting structure. And so, for example, this might be a really strong structural core using moment frames. Or, if we want to, we could make a strong structural core using shear walls. And so, in an earthquake, the, the seismic loads are resisted by this structure, which is strong and stiff, and the flexible, dangerous, soft story frames they don't have to withstand any earthquake. They just must be designed so they can follow the movements without getting damaged. And that's relatively easy to do. And so the architect is happy because we have achieved the elevation required, but we've got this internal structure doing all the hard work in resisting the earthquake forces. This is the best solution. Another solution is to create what we call a mega frames. And so, say we've got a three-story building, one, two, three. What we do is to put pure hinges at the ends of these beams at this story here. And so, effectively, we're creating one frame here and another mega frame here. And so now our building is structurally more regular and we haven't got the situation of this story being a lot more flexible than the other stories. And so we've got a more regular structure and because of these pins, these beams do not resist any earthquake load. The beams will just resist the gravity load. And we can design this building against earthquake as a two-story mega frame. Uh, alternatively, we, can, we could put in a story of beams at this level. So now we are creating a four-story frame, which is regular. But at this level, there are no floor slabs, just the beams. And sometimes this is, a, this is acceptable to architects, because you can have the, spacious, the spaciousness of the volume, um, Okay, it's compromised by the beams cutting through the volume, but as I say, sometimes that's acceptable. So that's another solution for you to consider. The next problem that is also dangerous, but not as dangerous as a soft story, is the short column. And we have to avoid this as architects and engineers. And a short column is also called a captive column. It occurs when the engineer designs a full height column and then the architect inserts some infills. And the masonry infills prevent the column from bending. And so now that this column, it can bend only from here to there. And so it becomes quite short. 
in short columns are dangerous because they snap. They can't bend and they can't absorb the earthquake energy. They just snap. Like that. And we usually get 45 approx degree cracks. And the column gets totally destroyed. Very short for its, its width, isn't it? And so it's very brittle. It, it always fails like this. Always. Here's a building in Indonesia. Uh, here's the height of the infill. You can see where the column pressed against the infill and the short columns they basically disappeared and I'm amazed this building didn't collapse so what are the solutions? the two solutions really the first solution is to separate But so there's no structural connection between the infill and the columns. Otherwise the columns will snap. Or we make some of the infills like into shear walls. And if we have a shear wall here, then this will be okay. That won't, we won't get a short column because the earthquake forces can be uh, resisted by the shear walls. So those are two solutions to avoid short columns. Uh, the next problem is uh, penetrations in structural walls. And I want to begin by showing you some structural walls that um, have no penetrations. So these are these are the best structural walls possible. And actually, these are from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Uh, the architects and engineers have got structural walls in this direction and structural walls in the orthogonal direction. And so, in both directions, structural walls to resist earthquake. And then they're going to uh, weld their floor systems um, onto their structural walls and create their multi-story building. So this is a, a really good example. You know, whenever possible, we try and avoid penetrating our structural walls, especially at the basis of the wall, because this is where we may get a plastic hinge forming. This is where we may get damage and cracking in an earthquake. Many, many years ago, I designed uh, this concrete shear wall. Uh, two, one on each side of this building. This building um, is a telephone exchange. And most of the telephone cables in New Zealand pass through this single building and it, it was going to collapse in a big earthquake because of short columns see the short columns and also because the beams are so strong compared to the columns so what we did was we designed um, two really big shear walls and we had to tell the architect, I'm sorry, but we cannot have any penetrations here. Because this is the area where we will get structural damage in a large earthquake. But we said to the earthquake, we said to the architect, it's okay for you to put penetrations higher up the shear walls. And so that was the strategy 
the architect accepted. I mean, this building uh, was a bit unusual because this building has very few people in it. It has uh, telephone equipment in it. And so it didn't matter that you know some windows were lost. And so we were able to have very good collaboration. No penetrations at the base, but yeah, penetrations up here, they were okay, no problem. And of course, if we want uh, regular penetrations in the shear wall, then as I explained in my first lecture, we can design the shear wall to be a coupled shear wall. Basically, two shear walls, one, two, joined by these very special <coughs> coupling beams. These beams that require special diagonal reinforcement so that they don't suddenly break, but they can absorb the earthquake energy. And so this is the usual strategy for penetrations. And if you are designing shear walls at a preliminary stage of design, then, and you're using the resist software, resist will actually tell you how many penetrations you could have if you click on the other results tab. Uh, resist will give you guidance as to the size of your penetrations that are allowable. And to finish off with, I want to just um, show you how problematic it is to have <coughs> penetrations in structural walls. And we're just going to look at some examples from this um, large earthquake in Chile in 2010. The interesting thing about the buildings in Chile, that is the architecturally designed multi-story buildings, is that the construction culture in such buildings is to use shear walls. The Chileans believe it's better for their buildings to be stiff rather than flexible. And so they don't use moment frames very often for buildings like this. And I think they're quite wise. And so here's a typical high-rise building using shear walls. Um, plenty, plenty of glazing, plenty of windows. And so if we look at the plan, uh, in the X direction, we can see six very good shear walls. There are also four very slender walls on the perimeter. But I don't think they're very useful. They're not useful because they're so short, they're so slender. So 95% of the earthquake loads in the X direction will be resisted by these shear walls, which you know is, is great. And in the Y direction, it's good configuration because we've got six good shear walls in the Y direction. Uh, and they, they, we've got nothing else actually in the Y direction. And so the configuration of this building looks really good at this level. Uh, maybe this is first floor or ground floor. But what happened was there are some bad penetrations in these walls lower down. And so some of these walls got, you know, really severely damaged. And probably this building, it may have needed to be demolished. You can see this is really severe structural damage and really hard to repair. 
and other parts of the walls also suffered severe damage due to bad penetrations. And um, some researchers did some studies of penetrations in buildings like this. And they discovered some really terrible structural penetrations. Like, here's a reasonably solid shear wall. I mean, it's got these penetrations, but it's still got a lot of strength through it, section. But look at, in the basement level, look how the shear wall has been reduced in strength. And so, I mean, this is just a disastrous piece of design. The wall is now so weak because there's so little wall left. And look at this wall. At ground floor, it's great. But in the basement, there's such a huge notch cut out of that wall. And okay, there's a little slender column there, but that probably will collapse in compression or tension. And actually, in that same earthquake, there was a lot of damage to this, this beam here. And I'm sure there would have been other damage. And here there are other irregularities. Like this is a sort of a moment frame. And then it becomes a shear wall. And then the shear wall is not continuous. And so the forces get so confused going from one system to another. And so it's inevitable there will be some serious structural damage in, in shear walls or frames like this. And here we have uh, this frame here. Uh, strong beams, actually strong columns above the first floor level. But at ground floor, look how weak that is. And so, you know, it's a wonder that this particular building didn't collapse uh, if we just look at this section alone. And so, the takeaway message is pretty simple. Engineers and architects, we need to collaborate really closely, you know, to avoid these sorts of vertical irregularities. We want to avoid walls with bad penetrations, especially near the base of the building. We need to avoid frames where some stories might be soft. But if you apply some of the ideas of today's lecture, you can see that there's some good solutions to overcome these problems. And so I'm going to say thank you, and we can have a time of questions. Thank you.
And after the earthquake, it was on a lean like that. And um, it was threatening to crush the buildings, the neighbouring buildings. And it was a really difficult um, repair or demolition project. But that had uh, bad penetrations and structural walls. Uh, there were probably also some soft stories in Christchurch uh, that would have led, well in fact probably um, one building collapsed due to a soft story and others would have, would have got damaged and needed demolition. So yes we saw all of these problems presented in, in New Zealand as well, but only for buildings built before, say, 19, um, 1980. After 1980, our design codes have really helped designers avoid these problems. Okay, and, uh, I believe uh, that's another note, uh, announcement I wanted to make that, uh, and I, I hope that all of you receive that, if not, uh, We'll try to send it. Andrew is going to give another lecture on Wednesday, just one floor below, and the civil engineering uh, department faculty in a uh, special hall uh, on New Zealand earthquakes and damage to uh, particularly concrete structures and ways to that uh, New Zealand engineers have handled uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation of those buildings after the earthquake. So if you're interested, then uh, I believe you will receive a reminder about about this. So okay, any, any, thank you, Andrew. Any other questions regarding the this lecture or other lectures? Have you got any new ideas how to solve your problems in design projects? Or how often do architects uh, discuss the design in the early stages uh, with structural or do they give like the final design and you give the solution? Yes, well, that's a really great question. I would put it like this. I would say inexperienced, inexperienced architects would go to the engineer late in the process. And they, but probably only once or twice in their career, because the engineer says to them, what you're showing me won't work. And so the engineer has to come up with a new scheme. And everything changes for the architect. The architect has to start the planning process again. But the experienced architect has had that bad experience and knows that maybe on day two of the preliminary design we need to have a discussion with the structural engineer uh, to look at these, what are the solutions? And then on day two they can agree on the structural systems and then the architect doesn't need to rework um, the plans. So as I say, uh, the more experienced architects, they, they will work with an engineer almost immediately. I mean, if only to understand what the seismic gap has to be on the building site. You know, what, what is the gap between the boundary and the builder? And so there needs to be that discussion really quickly in the process. And also, I mean, the geotechnical aspects need to be discussed often too, you know, at an early stage. What are the, what's the foundation type? Because, you know, the ground conditions affect the foundations that affect the decisions about the superstructure. So, so yes, we are always um, recommending um, early collaboration. So thank you so much. Another question. Is in New Zealand, uh, this is a different answer, I know it's different in different countries. 
uh, in a consulting firm, are the architects and engineers together? Is it the same firm or they work separately? In most firms, they're separated. But there are a few firms, a, there are a few architectural firms that have in-house structural engineers. Are they a minority? Or? They're the minority. So they were separate. And I mean, there are pros and cons for both models. Uh, but I mean, one, one development that is a bit frightening for architects is that after the Christchurch earthquake, some clients went straight to engineers mm -hmm. and said, give me a structure for my site. And then the client goes to the architect and says, please make this building work architecturally. And this is a very worrying trend for architects because in the past the clients would always go first to the architects and so in New Zealand the clients are aware that the structure of the building is so important you know we, we don't want to have to demolish we must get the structure right and so this is a very interesting but troubling development that is after 2011. Yeah. Okay, so there are no more uh, questions. First, maybe a final thank you to Andrew, and then two more steps, or three more steps. One, uh, we'll give a special their certificates for everybody, but uh, Professor Obrado has suggested that uh, professors get personally certificates, and everybody else picks their certificate because there are about 70 certificates, and it's not probably practical to give one at a time. So we'll uh, put the rest of the certificates here on the on this uh, uh, desk and uh, you can you can pick up yours. I think they're arranged in order. And uh, but first uh, we'll give to a professors mostly from architectural and a few from civil engineering to uh, to get uh, certificates from Andrew personally. And then uh, the final step is to take a photograph, uh, a group photograph after you picked up your certificate.